Hello to you friends. This is Stammer on Air. But first, the daily early Buddhist contemplation. All beings are born and created by the Kama. They are formed, shaped, conditioned, elevated and restricted by their Kama. These past actions, this past behavior, is a womb of probability from which they re-emerge. All beings are owners of their karma, debtors to their karma, and they inherit their karma. Whatever they do, whether good or bad, the later effects of that will be theirs only. This accumulation of probability follows them like a shadow of the past that never leaves. Therefore does this karma come to divide all beings into high and low, beautiful or ugly. Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air number 53 on Anapanasati breathing meditation and a lotus offering. But first, the normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Worthy Anobo and perfectly self enlightened was the blessed Buddha. First, uh, one of my long-term supporters, Mr. Chris Britton of California, wished that himself, uh, his brother, uh, mother, father, and wife should be enlightened in this life. And for this purpose, he offered five lotuses to the Lord Buddha's tooth relic inside candy. And this lotus offering, which I've performed some days ago, comes right here. Hello to you, friends. This is the third lotus offering to the Lord Buddha's tooth and this is so that Mr. Chris Britton, his wife Seham, his mother Kathy, his father George, his brother Zachary may attain Nibbana as soon as possible and they live in the Northern California and these magnificent white lotuses, five of them, will go and offer to the Lord's Buddha's tooth, which lies just under the golden roof up there. You see, this is a Buddhist flag, and inside this temple, under this golden roof, lies the Buddha's tooth. Before the offering, we're gonna wash your feet. This is the temple where the tooth itself is kept. And we can see from outside where it's actually located. It's located up on the second floor in behind these doors here. That lies the tooth. This is the one the tooth is carrying around. The elephant back. Lying on the second swing.
Chris Britton, Mr. Chris Britton from Northern California. So that his father, mother, brother, and wife. Can I go away here? Sorry. Prince Tad and Princess Himawa. She came with the tooth. Princess Himawa had the tooth up in her, hidden up inside her hair. Inside there. In the secondary shrine room. Between the British? Where all the uh, Buddha statues from the foreign countries, they are located. International Buddhist Museum in connected to the Temple of the Tooth, uh, where all the Buddhist countries you see here uh, have their own room and ex display on how they uh, express Buddhism. And this is a, a copy of uh, the Buddhist statue from Sanath, from the Sanchi Stupa, made by King Asoka or Emperor Asoka. Oil lamps burning. We offer uh, oil and incense. Magnificent smell inside here. The pulsel and plenty of perfume. The former president with the Tusker elephant, which carries the tooth around before, which stands up here. Cremated. 
83. Ah, 83. Thank you. Ah, here it is again. Prima Daza. An elephant. At off of water to this Bodhi tree, which is a sapling, one of the 16 saplings uh, from the sapling that came from Bulgaria with Sangamitta, the Arahant Cheri Sangamitta, which established the Bikuni Sangha, the Sangha of nuns here on Sri Lanka. Uh, Typic singer this time. Iconography, like the sitting Buddha, the line, Parinibbana Buddha. Sariputta, the right hand disciple, and the blue, left hand disciple, Mahamokayana, and the standing Buddha. Yeah, yeah, Buddha Mitya uh, also. Yeah, huh? yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, here you are. So, you can see in the depiction of him. He has a flower in his hand. He's very happy for flowers. Yeah. He has a Buddhist in his head. And this is how he looks as a Buddhist sattva in uh, Tushita heaven. There's a boat tree where we're going to offer water. We're going to walk three times around the boat tree, uh, keeping it to the right. And then we will offer the water uh, for the Californian family of Mr. Chris Britton. Before we offer the water, we wash. I'll feed again. And you see the water is filtered by a small filter. So small animals are not harmed by the water we take. It's a rule by a linear rule by the Buddha, the thumb by the Buddha. All water should be filtered. First round, keeping the boat tree, massive boat tree, three or four meters trunk to the right. So much for the lotus offering, uh, which is worth noticing since the range and the merits of the Samasam Buddhas are infinite, then any offer to them, the effects of that offer, the karmic response, the karmic probability echo, which is very, very, very advantageous, that also will be infinite, both in magnitude and length duration of response infinite so that's why it's worth doing question 173 was uh, Bande please do a detailed instruction video on Anapanasati breathing meditation and uh, this I'll try to do despite the wind Anapanasati breathing meditation is a unique and truly wonderful, marvelous meditation technique. It is the meditation technique among meditation techniques, of which there are 40 in the Buddhist tradition put forth by the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama. This is one of them. Notably, uh, all Buddhas, both the last Buddha and all the former Buddhas, and all the Buddhas in the future to come 
they would all use this breathing meditation technique uh, to t their tool to awaken at the night of awakening and long before and long after also. So breathing meditation technique is really central. It's a core technique in early Buddhism. Why so? It can induce all four jhanas, all four rupa jhanas, one, two, three, and four, can be induced. And this entails, since the fourth jhana can uh, eradicate the mental fermentation, the asavas, that by one technique, one can go from uninstructed word like all the way up to full enlightenment. So this technique alone, all by itself, can induce enlightenment gradually. This no other technique can do. No other technique can do that. And therefore it is truly unique, this technique. It includes both arms of the classical uh, meditation techniques in ancient India. One is calm, to calm down the mind, to still the mind, samatha, and the other one is gaining insight, vipassana. So Anapanasati breathing meditation includes both calm, samatha, and vipassana inside. So therefore it's also a complete technique. It can be used by all temperaments, all sorts of people can use it. And so it's uh, one size fits all. And it has no side effects. Uh, this means that uh, some, some meditation techniques, they will have side effects if used by the wrong people. So if you do meta meditation, then you become, have a tendency to become slightly more greedy. So greedy people should not do that as a primary meditation object. If you do asupa discussed skeleton uh, corpse meditation, then you'll have to, a tendency to be a little more aversive so angry people uh, should not do uh, that meditation technique as a primary meditation object. However, Anapanasati technique, breathing, doesn't have any adverse side effects. Can use be all by all people in all situations. In the supermarket, on the pillow, everywhere, one can be aware of the breath touch inside the nostrils, which is the focus point in Anapanasati breathing meditation. It's a tactile point touch inside the nose, where the nose touch the nostril when passing in and out doing breathing. So soft touch. Some will experience, usually it's on the inside of the nostril, the rim of the nostrils, but can also be on the tip of the nose or can also be of the upper lip. But the common thing is the inside of uh, the rim of the nostrils and in this, in this related area. This is the focus point. Uh, to learn to force mind to stay on only one object, moment after moment after moment after moment. And in this case it's particularly tricky, but therefore also particularly rewarding, because it's a moving target. It's not a still target like a candle or a painting on the wall or your arm. It's a moving target because the breath goes in and out, and sometimes it even stops. In between going in and out, there's a break. And there it really takes a good training in awareness to keep being aware of it when it's not present. It can be used by both beginners and advanced meditators, and they will all have some, uh, get some uh, new stuff, new learning, and new progress on the path. The, the, from day one, uh, the new beginner meditator experiences calm. And uh, 15 years down the road, and this is, I have done this myself for around 15 years, close to 20 probably, still one is learning. So it's a technique that just expands and expands and expands in range and detail and scope. Therefore also it is a truly unique and wonderful meditation technique. Seventh advantage is that the mental hindrances, the five mental hindrances, they are blown away momentarily 
as soon as this awareness of the breath is established, then there cannot be any five mental hindrances. And that's actually what opens the door, enables attaining the four jhanas. That is, the five mental hindrances are absent. That is, the mental hindrance of sense desire is not there when you are aware of the breathing. The mental hindrance of aversion and ill will, it is absent when aware of breathing. Lethargy and laziness is absent when aware of breathing. Restlessness and regret is absent, non-existent, momentarily when aware of breathing. And doubt and uncertainty is also, the mental hindrance of doubt and uncertainty is also not present as soon as one is aware of breathing and as long as one is aware of breathing. The eighth advantage is that it's still this conceptual overcooking, overthinking, like worrying on, or conceptualizing or speculating or uh, brewing up all kinds of suspicions uh, and paranoia that uh, is as particularly prone uh, to people in the Western society which is caused by stress. Uh, the tempo is very fast. Uh, advertisement and information flow is very fast. This causes stress. This causes a lot of conceptual thinking. The mind is churning in overgear, in fifth gear, and it cannot come down and calm down. But this conceptual thinking actually is stilled completely by this breathing meditation. So it's particularly well suited for stressed people in the Western societies or stressed people all over the world, you can say, or stressed be beings all over the universe, even. The ninth advantage is that uh, the four foundations of awareness, the four great frames of reference, the Satipatthanas, Chattari Satipatthanas, they are gradually established by this technique, even when used alone. So this, these four foundations of awareness, these four great frames of reference, as the Buddha say, is the one and only way for the purification of beings. The one and only way. Ikkayana makko. It's the four foundations of awareness. That is, seeing the body only as a frame. Seeing the feelings only as a reactive response seeing the mind only as a set of habituated moods and seeing all phenomena as mental states that just are passing. Regarding all phenomena within these four frames of reference, that is right awareness, sammasati, a factor of the noble eightfold way, leading to enlightenment, the method to end suffering. So also in this regard, that this Anapanasati breathing meditation in itself alone can establish these four foundations of awareness, the Satipatthanas. That is unique. That is indeed wonderful. The tenth advantage is, and here you see that uh, there's established a causal link to enlightenment itself, Bodhi, namely that the seven links to enlightenment, the Sambuyangas, they are gradually completed by this meditation technique, little by little over the years. The awareness link to awakening, Sadi Sambuyanga, it is, com is completed. The investigation link to awakening, Dhamma Vichaya Sambuyanga, is also complete. The energy, Virya link to awakening, is completed. The joy, Piti Sambuyanga, is also completed. The tranquility link to awakening. Pasati Sambuyanga is also completed and finalized. The concentration link to awakening is also completed. And the equanimity, Upekka Sambuyanga, is also completed during Anapanasari meditation. When these seven links to awakening is completed, 
then enlightenment occurs. The phase transition of consciousness occurs at the moment that these seven links to awakening is finalized, is completed up to a certain threshold level. No other meditation technique can do that. No other meditation technique can do that on its own. This will uh, suffice for an introduction. And I pre-recorded the 16 points so they can be listened to in headphones while on the pillow, and follow them straight. And these 16 points, which come in four tetrads, four groups of four, which actually is why they complete or establish these four foundations of awareness, is these four tetrads making up 16 points, which comes right here. The 16 points of breathing Anapanasati meditation goes like this. Once in Savatthi, the Bliss Buddha said this, because there's one unique thing which when trained and cultivated is of great fruit and great advantage. What is that one unique thing? It is awareness by breathing Anapanasati And how because is this awareness by breathing trained, developed, cultivated and refined so that it is of great fruit and of immense long-term advantage? It is so. Because when a bhikkhu who has gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, he sits down cross-legged, having straightened his body and back and set up awareness around the nostrils. Then just plainly aware of only that breathing itself. He breathes in and then just solely aware of only that breathing itself. He breathes out. One. Breathing in long, he notes, notes. And understand, I inhale long. Breathing out long, he notes, knows, and understand, I exhale long. Two, breathing in short, he knows, notes, and understand, I inhale short. Breathing out short, he knows, notes, and understands. I exhale short. Three, he trains us, experiencing the entire body. I will breathe in and out. Four, calming all bodily activity. I'll breathe in and out. 5. Experiencing enraptured joy. I'll breathe in and out. 6. Experiencing a happy pleasure. I will breathe in and out. 7. Experiencing all mental activity. I'll breathe in 
and out. 8. Coleman, silencing, stilling all mental activity. I'll breathe in and out. 9. Experiencing the present mood. I'll breathe in and out. 10. Gladdening, elating and satisfying the mind. I'll breathe in and out. 11. Concentrating, condensing and focusing the mind. I'll breathe in and out. 12. Releasing and liberating the mind. I'll breathe in and out. 13. Contemplating impermanence. I'll breathe in and out. 14. Contemplating dissolution. I will breathe in and out. 15. Contemplating ceasing. I will breathe in and out. 16. He trains us. Contemplating relinquishment. I will breathe in and out. It is because when awareness by breathing is trained, developed and refined in exactly this very way that is of great fruit and immense advantage. So this was the 16 points. They are promoted by all the Buddhas, of course, because they use them for the tool for enlightenment. And lately it has also uh, been promoted by many monks, including Vibhu Sayadaw, which was a teacher of Ubakin, which you see here, both Ubakin and Vibhu. Uh, and Ubakin uh, then founded the Vipassana organization, which now have over 50 international meditation centers of uh, considerable quality. So it is still in the tradition of early Buddhism today, this unique, wonderful technique. Before, ask, before embarking on this technique, which is a lifelong activity, best done in the morning, around 5 a.m., after having washed one's face, drunk a cup of tea, stressed out, then sitting in a, silently in a, in a place where one is alone, can use earplugs. There are some preliminaries, which usually are skipped over, uh, but these are, are fairly uh, important. Why so? Because the success on the pillow, the degree of calm, and eventually the attainment of jhana is dependent upon that the sila, the morality, is pure. So this means that the five precepts, they should be fulfilled and purified completely before one can expect to do considerably progress uh, doing any meditation technique, actually, not only Anapanasati meditation. So this means that uh, usually when people having come here with, and ask me for problems regarding their meditation, then the, it's not the problems with meditation itself, what's happening on the pillow when they sit down. It's problem in their private life and economy life and so on, outside, what happened long time ago, outside in their private life, there the problems arise. Because of these problems are not finalized, they are not uh, kind of like exhausted or dealt with or coped with, then in, inside the meditation on the pillow, regret and remorse arise repeatedly. And this excludes happiness. And since happiness is the proximate cause of concentration and also of calm, both samatha and samadhi, then uh, this this calm doesn't come because minds keep churning on these conflicts or moral transgressions that happened long time ago, either subconsciously or consciously. And this excludes happiness, which thereby excludes concentration, samadhi. Samadhi doesn't occur, and this uh, ruins the show, and uh, jhana is excluded as long as sila 
is not established. So a pure morality has to be performed first. So this one should think about if one has problems meditating, is there any, any, any problem, unseen problem, unknown problem, undealt with problem in one's moral life? So the minimum is the five precepts. I hereby accept and undertake the training rule of avoiding all killing, avoiding all stealing, avoiding all sexual abuse, avoiding all dishonesty, and avoiding all use of alcohol and drugs. This should be fulfilled first, before one can expect any considerable success with any meditation technique, but in particular breathing meditation. The situation, location and posture, it can be any place where there is uh, uh, no people, but it can also be actually at work when you're sitting for yourself, then watching the breath, watching the breath go in and out. And as soon as you will experience, as soon as you establish this awareness of the breath go in and out, the mind's calm down. And you're much, able, much better able to cope with all the problems of daily life while being aware of the breath. Why is that so? Because momentarily, instantly, at the very moment the awareness of the breath is established, then the five mental hindrances are absent. They are blown away. Gone. They come back as soon as the, the awareness of the breath is falling out, then one has a relapse of the five mental hindrances. And then attack the mind again. So, uh, absence of the five mental hindrances, sense desire, ill will, laziness, restlessness, and doubt and uncertainty. This is both an advantage on the pillow and in the private life. Wherever one goes, it's an advantage not to be hindered, mentally speaking. One can sit cross-legged like this. One doesn't need to sit in a lotus position. Uh, one can sit with a, a back up, a, leaning up against something. One can also sit on a chair, uh, basically with an armchair, with, so one is leaning up uh, and stabilized by the arms. Uh, one should sit with the back straight. If one sits on the floor, then one can stretch the legs and still, but still keep, keep them crossed. Sit with straight legs and then uh, back rest. That's a good idea to do something. Have a pillow in the back also. The straight spine is important so the breathing becomes free. If you fall forward uh, or you fall backward, leaning backward, then the breathing is not free. And then uh, the meditation is hindered. That's a block. So uh, straight spine. How to attain a, a straight spine in an easy way? It is to remember the cosmic traction. And this is kind of like a traction. There was a hook here on the angle of uh, the lower jaw. And if you take one, then this should be up. So just remember that the, low, the angle of the lower jaw should be tra contracted up like that it was somebody pulling in it from cosmic heights. So remember that. And then as soon as the chin starts falling down like this, then you're losing your posture. Then the, the bending forward start occurs. This happens usually when calm comes. Just remember, notice the chin for, starts falling, ah, then up, up again. Cosmic traction. Let's keep this, the spine straight. This is the correct posture. Then breathing in and out occurs very smoothly and unhindered. Then it's easy to be aware of it. Then, uh, before one can do, uh, one can do some, what I call brooming the mind. It's kind of like cleaning it, uh, just roughly. Then it's seeing uh, if there's any uh, mental hindrances, then one substitute them with the opposite before starting, before starting on the regular meditation. So it's also a kind of preliminary, but after having sit on the pillow. It's also a good idea to have a clean house. It's not a, a messed up house. Uh, a clean body also, having taken a bath recently, uh, clean clothes. 
So the, not, mind doesn't go out to these problems that are in the immediate vicinity of the meditating person. Clean body, clean house, clean clothes. Good idea. Nevertheless, brooming the mind is when you sit on the pillow, then you notice if there's any sense desire uh, present. If one wants to go to the fridge or see a film or whatever, if one wants to see something, hear something, taste something, touch something, or think something, I have some particular mental state, then there's sense desire present. Then one uh, exchange that, substitute that sense desire, which is a mental hindrance, will focus on a disgusting thing. A disgusting thing like a rotting corpse, a, an image of a rotting corpse, or the skeleton, one's own skeleton, or some skeleton one has seen, then the sense desire goes away. One evaluates also if there's aversion, ill will towards persons, uh, family problems, spouse problems, children's problems, job problems, uh, boss problems, if there's anything of that where one is against something, political problems, teacher problems, meditation center problems, colleague problems. If there's any, one is kind of like pushing towards other beings or situations, then one should notice that ah, there's a version in my mind, ill will is in this mind, and then substitute with universal friendliness, rational and extended focus on universal friendliness. Then this evaporates this problem. This is blooming the mind. So if there's any laziness and lethargy uh, present in the mind, then one turns attention to three elements. The element of initiative, the element of launching, and the element of endurance. Of having turned rational attention to these three elements, lethargy and laziness is broomed out. Then one turns one's attention and evaluates, look after, scrutinizes, whether there any restlessness and regret present in the mind. Restlessness will be kind of like unrest. The mind is not settled. Regret and remorse is uh, that you're looking back on situations, things you have done, uh, lied, you have told, or misappropriation of values, or taxation problems, or insurance fraud, or whatever, uh, adultery with somebody else's spouse, uh, whatever you have done that was a transgression of uh, the five precepts, or of good morality in general. This can call regret and remorse. Then one notes, are ah, there's restlessness, regret and remorse present in the mind. Then one exchanges with noticing, are ah, there's this calm of the mind and calm of the body. There's this calm of the mind and calm of the body. Then this restlessness and regret goes away. Then one sees if there's any doubt and uncertainty present in the mind, in the mind. Whether one whether one does this correct or not, or whether one should do it at all, or whether one should do something else, or speculation about what's tomorrow and the job and the lover and the job and the future and so on. All this is doubt and uncertainty. One is not sure about what will happen or what, what has happened. Then as soon as one has this safe diagnosis, ah, there's doubt and uncertainty present in this mind, then one's exchanged with rational attention, turning rational attention, redirecting mind rationally to uh, four aspects, namely the evaluation. There are blameful and blameless states. There are advantageous and disadvantageous states. There are ordinary and exalted states. And there are things on the bright side and on the dark side. So when these four evaluations have been performed, the doubt and uncertainty have evaporated. Now one has broomed the mi mind. This is a good idea before starting, because then one starts from a, a fairly clean spot, uh, not only physically clean, but also mentally clean, internally, mentally clean. Good, good place to start, good starting points. Then another uh, preliminary uh, before starting is a minimum establishing of the mindfulness of the breath. 
after having sit down and erect spine and notice the breath touch in the nostrils, one can do that by breathing forcefully three times and then noting where the sensation is maximal and then keeping the, the attention there. Eyes should be closed, but the eye bulbs, uh, where one looks uh, beneath the closed eyelids, should point towards the tip of the nose. Because then attention automatically goes where the eyes are directed. So if your eyes are pointing, like your, with open eyes, are, are, try to look at your own tip of your nose with both eyes. Then they will be focused on this point. Then attention will also go on this point. And this is close to where the breath touch is. So it's a ta the tactile sensation, the breath touch inside the nostrils, then it's the focus point that one should be aware of all the time. So before one starts, uh, the commentary mentions two techniques uh, named counting and connecting. And this is one bre uh, brief uh, count the, the breath in a special way. When one starts to say, breathe in, one, breathe out, one, breathe in, two, Breathe out two. Breathe in three. Breathe out three. Breathe in four. Breathe out four. Breathe in five. Breathe out five. So one counts up to five, or if advanced up to ten. Between five, not less than five, and not more than ten. One can settle on a number, start with five, and then uh, progress to six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. But not uh, count more than ten. When one comes to ten, ten in, 10 out, then one starts again at 1. 1 in, 1 out. This one do does 3 times. Then one is aware of breathing in and breathing out, but one is not aware in the, in the middle here where one doesn't breathe in and out. Neither here where one doesn't have started a new in-breath. So one counts once again, it's called connecting. Connecting the breath. 1 in, 2 out. 2 in, 3 out. 3 in, 4 out. So now I have four out. Senior so said four in. This means I connect these two breaths. This means I, I'm aware in between the breath down here in the valley. And also on the top. So this connects the breath. Otherwise one will be aware only when breath come in and breath come out. But when breath, breath does not come in or out, when one loses awareness. So these two kind of countings, up to five or up to ten, three times. Unbroken. If one makes a mistake, then one goes back to uh, the f uh, square one and starts all over again. And one keeps doing that until one learns it. And one can sit counting for hours, actually. And I did that in the beginning, and many do that in the beginning. You, you can find your uh, self counting because of lack of awareness up to 11 or 12 or 19 or 39. 39 in, 39 out. And you should count only to 10. So there, you can say, mind has elapsed between 10 and 39. And so this is very rewarding. One sees uh, how unaware mind is. Even when trying to be aware, it can lapse from this awareness, just like that. The training here actually goes on establishing unbroken, continuous mindfulness, awareness, consciousness of this breast touch, which is, as I say, a moving target. So it's especially difficult, but it's also especially rewarding. Because when you have to use this awareness out in the real world situation, it's also moving targets. They don't stand still. They're not symbolic, like a cross or anything like that, easy to recognize. They also move around. So it's better fitted to the normal situation of normal life to be aware of a moving target. Because normal life in a normal situation, whether in private life or at work or on the street, is a multitude, a cacophonic uh, chaos of moving targets for mind to jump from here and there, there. Instead of keeping just one focus, which makes it calm and clear. So, 
this was so much for uh, the counting and connecting in the preliminary states. Now we go to the detail of the explanation of the 16 points. Uh, what to know. So the first point is breathing in long, he knows, notes and understand, I inhale long. Then non labels while inhaling long and one inhale long at least three times and exhale long at least three times before going to the next point, point two. But uh, inhaling long, one labels inside the head silently, long inhalation, long inhalation. Exhaling long, one labels twice internally, silently, long exhalation, long exhalation. Breathing in and out long has the function of calming the mind, as you can notice for yourself. If you breathe in very slowly, very fine, very silently, then mind comes down. While you, <laughs> if you breathe quickly, then mind is alerted. So this can be used as kind of like the brake and the speed of doing the meditation. If you feel that the mind become lazy and sluggy and heavy, breathe faster. If you notice mind become kind of like waggy waggy, restless, wandering around, jumping, not settled, breathe slowly. Otherwise, naturally, when just following the breath, it will go down slower and slower and slower. So there's no need to force it. But this, this break and speed uh, trick can be used when there is problems with either heavy, sluggish mind or restless, agitated mind. Number two, breathing in short, he notes, notes and understands, I inhale short. Breathing out short, he knows, notes and understands, I exhale short. So again there, labeling, when inhaling short, short inhalation, short inhalation. When exhaling short, label inside certainly by recognizing this was a short exhalation, short exhalation, short exhalation. Do this also uh, three times at least before uh, going on to the next point. Three, he trains that experiencing the entire body, I will breathe in and out. The entire body has three meanings, according to the commentaries. The first is experiencing the body as one thing in one entire experience with closed eyes. That you experience from the top of the head to the tip of the toe as one thing in one go. So it's not like attention wanders all over the body. You see the skeleton and flesh, organs and bones covered with skin in one experience. This is seeing the entire body. Second notion of the entire body is body scanning. Scanning from the tip of the hair, the cranium, the brain, the nose, uh, the teeth, the tongue, the throat, the lungs, the bones in the neck, the bones in the shoulders, the spine, the arms, the fingers, the nails, the lungs, the heart, the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, uh, the large bowel, the small bowels, the urinary bladder, uh, the testicles, the ovaries uh, or the uterus, uh, the legs, the knees, the bones in the legs and knees, until one comes down uh, to the feet, the heel bone and uh, the toe bones and finish out in the little toe nail. Then one finishes the little toe nail on the right side, one goes to the little toe nail on the left side and then scans up again one till comes to the tip of the hair. So one start with hair and go scan down and then scan up again. One can also start with the foot, then scan up and then scan down on the other side. Body scanning. This is one aspect of the... The second aspect is see the body as four great elements. The Mahabhutas. This body is only solidity, which is solidity on the macroscopic level and the force of extension uh, on the microscopic level, superatomic level. 
Solidity is particularly present in the teeth, in the bones, and the solid parts of the body. Tendons to some extent also. It's also made of fluidity, uh, which is fluidity on the microscopic level and cohesion. The force of cohesion is not a material. It's a property, it's a quality. It's not a substance. And same thing with solidity. It's a quality, it's a property, but it's not a substance. So the body is made here of, sub of properties, qualities, but not of substances. So one sees that as solidity, fluidity, fluidity will be particularly present in the blood, the spit, the urine, uh, the pus, the snot, uh, the fluid in the brain, and the fluid in the joints. Then one sees also as heat, which is heat on the macroscopic level and vibration on the microscopic level, and as motion, which is kinetic energy on the microscopic level and stored in the sugar and all other chemical compounds that can be burned up and converted into um, a kinetic energy, the energy of motion, like walking, running, and so on, but also breathing. Then one sees as the breath body, this is the third, last, seeing the entire body aspect. This one does, uh, because the Buddha said that the breathing in itself is a body, it's a breath body. And this is seen, it's very subtle, but also very addictive, very rewarding. The technique comes by seeing the start of the in-breath, noting the start of the in-breath, while breathing in. Well, no, ah, now I start breathing in are the middle of the in-breath and the end of the in-breath. Same thing with the exhalation. And as I say, now the break is over, one start exhale, the start of the exhalation, the middle of the exhalation and the end of the exhalation. Then there's a break again in the middle of the next inhalation, the, the start of the next inhalation, the middle of the inhalation and the end of the inhalation. And then again a break I start on the next exhalation, the middle of the exhalation, and the end of the exhalation. So both inhalation and exhalation is noted in three points, start, middle, and end. And then one will see that when one has noticed that the inhalation or exhalation has stopped, still something is happening. No air is going in and out, but still some movements is going in and out. And this movement is the breath body. Experiencing the breath body when it's close to making significant progress in breathing meditation. And again, it comes by noticing and labeling the beginning, the middle, and the end of both inhalation and exhalation at least three times. Last point in the first titret. Calming all bodily activity, I will breathe in and out. One calms off movements of the body, all shaking, all tremor of the body. One calms down the breathing until one cannot hear it or hardly perceive it by making it long, fine, and silent. But not too much, not to the extent that you feel you need more air that you're feeling that you're being choked, that you need more air. Not so much, but just up to the edge of that. As long and as fine and as silent and as slow as you can make the breath without feeling any urge for more air. After that, hold the pulse, feel the pulse, usually here, on the point where there's a bump, small bump here, just below that, put two fingers and you feel the pulse. Try to make the pulse slower. Then also imagine, so now you have calmed down the movements, the breath, the pulse, and then also calm down the metabolism, the burning of sugar and all the chemical processes in the body. This is calming all bodily activity.
Point five, experiencing enraptured joy, pity. I will breathe in and out. That one tries to be kind of like, yuppie, 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 do. Uh, enraptured, joyous, gladdened, in an excited way, and try to fill up the body with that. First fill up the head, then the trunk, then the legs and arms, and then go out to filling it out into the eyebrows, into the hair, tip of the hairs, uh, and the tip of the earlobes, and out into the fingernails. So one perfuses, suffuses, fills up this body with enraptured joy. Point six, experiencing a happy pleasure, sugar, sukha, happiness, a happy pleasure one tries to sing, to fill up, but now it's a gladness or a joy, a happiness, but it's devoid of excitation. There's no excitement here. It's not agitated. Happiness is calm. So one, with this calm happiness, one fills the entire body. First the head, then the trunk, then the arms, the legs, and again out into the hairs, out into the teeth, out into the earlobes, out into the tip of the hairs, out into the little toenail. Everywhere should this be filled. The body should be as covered with a white cloth, completely covered with this happiness. Why so? Because uh, this is to induce jhana and induce samadhi. Because the proximate cause of this samadhi is this happiness. So one tries to get the mind into that state by training it. Experiencing all mental activity, I'll breathe in and out, is point seven. All mental activity is all sensing. All thinking, all wanting, all willing, all hoping. All sensing is all seeing, all hearing, all smelling, all tasting, all touching, and all thinking, wanting and willing. So this one experiences that. If one sees something under the eyes, a black color, seeing, seeing, if one hears something, hearing, hearing, if one tastes something, tasting, tasting, touching, the knee or the bottom, touching, touching, thinking about it, thinking, thinking. So one experiences what mind is doing moment by moment, moment by moment. Point eight, calming all bodily activity, all mental activity, I'll breathe in and out. Here one, uh, having noted these inputs, whether it's internal inputs from the thinking or external inputs by sensing something from the external world, one blocks it out. As soon as it notices there is an input, one blocks it out, except one input. And then it's the tactile breath touch in the nose, which one keeps aware of all the time. So one, anything else is blocked out. If any thinking starts, one stop thinking. If any feeling starts in the knee, one blocks it up. One doesn't let it come into the mind. So there's these doors, inputs from the senses, they eventually go into the door of attention of the mind. This door should be closed, except for one input, that is the breast touch in the nostrils. So this is calming all mental activity. Because then sensation will be stilled, thinking will be stilled, one thing would be still, hoping would be still. Only awareness of the breath is present then. Block all other inputs out. Point nine. Experience the present mood, I'll breathe in and out. Yeah, one simple thing uh, of going to this is to say, is this mind now elated? It is on the, it's on the happy side, on the satisfied side, on the content side. It's a positive mind. Or is it neutral? Or is it on the negative side, this suppressed, depressed, unsatisfied, frustrated, or whatever? So is it on the plus side, neutral or minus? Just notice that. Notice that and label it. Plus, neutral, minus. This is experience of the present mood. Number 10 is gladdening, elating, and satisfying the mind. I'll breathe in and out. 
there once again, one try to pull up the mind and gladden it, making it happy by satisfying it, saturating it with joy. Again, a, an attempt, a trick to increase the probability of samadhi, jhana to occur. Now, when the mind is glad and happy and satisfied, it can also become calm, because now it don't need to search for this happiness anymore, this gladness that they were searching for before. So now one can, point 11, focus, condense and concentrate the mind while breathing in and out. Focus is first done on focusing, keeping all the thing out, and then focus on the breath touch in the nostril, then condense the mind, make it more thick, more dense, and then concentrating the mind, boiling it down, and making it like a lens that is focusing on only one point, ikka jhana, sitta. So it's mind going only one place, only one place. That is the breast touch in the nostrils. Twelve, releasing and liberating the mind. I will breathe in and out. Here, instead of having a very uh, forceful pull and control on the mind, one sets it free. One let it go. Just like you have a, have a bird, except a do, imagine a dough you have in your hand, and then you're letting it go into the air. Then it can fly free. So this is this point here, point twelve. Releasing and liberating the mind, setting it free. It gives kind of like a rush uh, feeling after having first gladdened the mind, then concentrated the mind. Now one is liberating the mind, saying, letting it go. It gives a kind of like a rush of freedom. The last title goes like this, contemplating impermanence, I'll breathe in and out. This can be done on many levels, but a good level for all is uh, contemplating the five clusters of clinging. So one contemplates all form, all feeling, all perception, all mental construction and all consciousness, whether internal or external, past, present or future as impermanent, as not lasting as something drifting by, as something transient, unstable, unsafe, not to be relied upon, not me, not mine, not myself. Point 14, contemplating dissolution, Viraga, I will breathe in and out. Here one sees that uh, since uh, these five clusters of cling, form, feeling, perception, mental construction, through all times, whether my own internally or others externally, always have been and always will be impermanent. Then there's nothing to be lasting happy over. And this causes a disillusion. This is a disillusion in the positive sense that one has been enveloped in an illusion about that it was worth running after these five clusters of clinging and clinging to them because one thought that they could provide lasting happiness. So it's good to come out of this process of illusion, of something that is illusory, by disillusion. So it's a coming back to a very realistic stance on these five clusters of clinging, as impermanent, as no self, as suffering. 15. Contemplate is ceasing, ending. I'll breathe in and out. Again, one can use the five classes of clinging as a reference point, but here the ending is seen as peace. How to end from feeling, perception, and mental construction and consciousness, clinging to them, how to end this clinging? Is this to end ignorance about that they are suffering, 
because this will end craving towards them, and thereby also clinging to them. So this process ends there. This is just for, for form. The body, it, it means ending, uh, feeding with physical food. For feeling, perception, and mental construction, it entails ending contact, passa, with the internal world and the external world. And for consciousness, it entails ending, naming, and forming. So when this ends, the five classes of cling ends, then suffering also ends. This is the last point. He trains contemplating relinquishment. It is one say, okay, I don't need these five clusters of clinging. I don't need a form. I don't need a body. I don't need a feeling. I don't need perception, experience of the world, or any internal experience. I don't need any mental construction, hoping, intention, wanting, planning, doing this and that. I don't need any consciousness. This one does by realizing that only the ending of this body is the irreversible freedom from all imprisonment. Remember seeing the body as a frame. It's a frame that imprisons the mind. The mind cannot be free as long as it's in the prison of the body. Same thing with feeling. One sees that only ending all feeling is the final irreversible freedom from all physical pain. One sees and relinquishes by seeing that only ending all perception is the irreversible freedom from all disturbance and noise. And one sees by realizing that only ending all mental construction, all hoping, wanting, planning, intending, only this is the final irreversible freedom from all stress. And finally one sees and realizes and thereby relinquishes that only the irreversible ending of consciousness can be the final freedom from all suffering. This is the last point of the 16th point. So, one sees here the last four points contemplating impermanence, dissolution, ending, and relinquishment. This is strictly speaking vipassana, it's inside. It's an inside job, you can say. It's pure inside. While the first two chitras, noticing the breath, calming the breath, Noticing the mental activity, calming the mental activity. This is more related to calm. So it starts with calm and ends with insight. It is, friends, when awareness by breathing is trained, developed and refined in exactly this way, that this breathing meditation is of great fruit and immense advantage, especially long term. It leads towards Nibbana. It promotes being towards deathlessness. It can induce all four jhanas and even awakening enlightenment itself. It does so for all Buddhas. There's a manual by Bhikkhu Nanamoli. It's called A Mindfulness of Breathing, Anapanasati, Buddhist text from the Pali Canon on Commentaries by Bhikkhu Nanamoli. It's all text that has, Buddha has spoken about this technique. And his monks also have spoken about the technique. Buddha, he spoke uh, an entire book about it, uh, double the thickness of this. Uh, it's in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Anapanasati Samyutta in Samyutta Nikaya, which you see here. But this small book is uh, free on my website, uh, but I recommend also buying a book form. It's a blue form, which you see here. 
but it's free on my website, can be read as a PDF file. I uh, warmly recommend uh, reading that. Uh, and then also, uh, there is, I will provide a link uh, to this text in, in the, in the, below the video here, and also uh, to several Dhamma drops on Anapanasati breathing meditation, and to a SoundCloud uh, on Anapanasati breathing meditation, I already have made. But otherwise, uh, one can clip out uh, by editing, sound editing, the 16 points from the first part of this video, and then hear this while doing the breathing meditation until one has memorized the 16 points. Otherwise, write down the 16 points on a piece of paper and have the piece of paper beside you all the time when you go through the 16 points. Then when you kind of remember, you can just take the paper without raising up and breaking the meditation posture, put the paper down again and proceed. This, I think, ends the exposition of Anapanasati breathing meditation, a unique and wonderful, fantastic meditation technique. The meditation technique per se, among all meditation techniques, which can, by itself, in and by itself, without anything else, induce all the four jhanas and enlightenment itself, body itself. Thank you for your attention. Remember to click subscribe down there if you have not already done. And if you want to have further information, subscribe to the website uh, or support these Buddhist videos and audios, then you can hover with your mouse over in this corner and uh, then a small eye, wide eye, click the small eye and there will be a drop down menu of five items just for you right there. Now, Tasso, Bhagavato, Arahato, Samma Sambuddhasa, Worthy, Honorable and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha. Thank you for your support, attention and appreciation and have a nice day. You heard Bhikkhu Samaita from the Cypress Hermitage on the Knuckles Mountain, Pamparella, Central Hill Country, Sri Lanka. Please subscribe to the Google group Buddha Direct and visit the website whatbuddhasit.net. May all beings become thus happy thereby. Thank you. Namo Tasso Bhagavato. Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy Honorable And perfectly self-enlightened Was the blessed Buddha As the next Buddha, the noble Arya Ajitta Mateya will say You can come as you like But you pay as you go Thank you for your contribution and have a nice